We're finally back with our last uh, talk for today's online stream day. Uh, our last speaker, last but not least, uh, it's Taiwan Yoon. Uh, he is the CBO of Super, uh, at Super Evil Mega Mega Corp and the owner of Fate Twin Research. And uh, the topic of his, of his speech will be um, history tells you what's next in F2P game monetization. So uh, please welcome to everyone and uh, welcome. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Cool. Welcome then. Uh, you can start right away if you're ready. Then, yeah. Okay. Sounds, sounds yeah. great. Um, Hi everyone, um, really, nice, really nice to be here, be able to talk to you guys um, about like my, essentially my personal view on um, what we need to in terms of on Web3 and that that is based on um, what I have ex experienced as a um, free to play game developer. Um, before I start, um, like if I talk a little about yeah, my, my company, but even the GACO, um, we are a team of game makers from uh, both AAA, um, free-to-play PC and console games, as well as experiences with mobile games. And we wanted to create a <clears throat> something that can appeal to everyone um, in the world. Um, we are a fully distributed uh, independent studio. Um, our employees are from 15 different countries. But we are trying to make sure that we are um, staying in the time zone so that we can actually work together. So that's why uh, we spend from the um, west coast of US to the, um, um, the central Europe at, at the moment. Um, one of our key interesting part of Spayable is that we actually build our own game engine to build mobile game, which is actually quite rare as a game developer, but that allows us to create something that can be differentiated from anyone else out there in the market. Also, we are trying to always build a um, something differentiated, but has a um, like always has a uh, four pillars altogether. Uh, it is a we want to create a cross platform game not only just a cross platform we want to make sure that the um the battles and combat we, we have in game works on any kind of platform as well as supporting um all kind of uh control scheme and we, we are proud of having a, a deep loot and progression system in our game uh also we want to create a like frictionally social play because at the end of the day uh, we believe that the um, gameplay is all about playing together and we also try to create a fandom around the IP we are working on, either something uh, we are building on our own or the license from somewhere else. Uh, so far, we have been around 10 years um, and we built a um, Vainglory, Cars Black, and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, uh, three titles so far. And then we are also working with Netflix and some other larger publishers and, and working on AAA cross-platform games with them. So that was about Spot Evil and a little bit about myself because this is actually important to understand how I came into the um, conclusion I have about Web3. I have been in game industry around 30 years. Um, I studied in 1993 building a text mod game in Korea, and then move, move on to the uh, part of um, EA, Blizzard, uh, Wargaming, and so on. And also, I had a um, briefly had a, my own startup company called Red Five Studios. Um, and across the um, like thirty last thirty years, essentially, I've been working in all kind of like different um, positions and, and roles. Um, experience from the game design to the um, um, sales and business development. And I was lucky enough to participate in building some of the biggest online games in the world, including StarCraft, World of Warcraft, World of Tank, Vainglory, and so on. What is interesting to me is that if you, if I look back the games I developed over the last 30 years, 
its business model has always changed. In back in 1993, the tax mode, the, the model we were using is that essentially um like players pay per minute. They were using modem um and then a uh phone line. And we charge, you know, as as they play the game, um we build them per per minute. And then uh StockCraft and other package games were obviously so like Nowadays, it's called a premium game or retail game. And then it moved on to the um, like subscription with the Ultima Online and then World of Warcraft. And starting in 2010, the model again moved from subscription to free to play, that which we had a World of Tank and, and Vainglory um, are the key games I worked on in that, in that space. So even though I worked on a lot of different games, I think that you know, there are like quite a few interesting dreams and challenges we experienced over the course of the last 30 years again. So the um, one, one good example would be a uh, with Ultima Online 30 years ago, it was one of the first MMORPG game in the world. And the that team essentially wanted to build a living and breathing world inhabited by intelligent NPCs. We wanted we wanted the, the NPCs in the game uh, living their life, having their, their own job and so on and so forth. But you know, technology didn't allow that to happen. So, what kind of solution we came up with? Uh, essentially, human employees of a company actually play the NPC. To entertain um, other game players, obviously, um, like it was fun, but it's not a great way to scale the size of the team or the um, like size of the business itself. And in World of Warcraft, one of the biggest challenges we faced was that the um, actually players consuming the content way way too fast, um, as well as as game is becoming bigger, also becoming older, the experience we have to provide to newbie players and experience we have to provide to the um, like old players becoming a completely different. Um, it started to create a two different um, type of players. So how to solve address these problems? You know, like we didn't have any, again, we didn't have any other option but to have a really big developers and spending two years to create a new expansion pack and so on. Even with that, once we release the expansion on a patch or new update, you know, you know, they, uh, some of the core players came back to us and say, hey, I know you guys worked on this game for two years, but, you know, I already run out of content to play, like, when is our uh, your next update? It is actually um, like really frustrating um, in a way, like spending two years of your time and then the people think that the um, doesn't have any anything new, interesting, and so on and so forth. Um, and the other problem we are facing at um, World of Warcraft was the presence of like so-called gold farmers and power leveling. Um, what it means is that the um, like gold farmers are, are the ones that the, um, um, play the game to collect in you know, a virtual currency in, in game, and then they, they sell it outside of the game system um, to make you know real world money. Some people also play the game for some other players, and then charge charge it like to other players for that. And, and, and now there was a third party um, item trade platforms that exist outside of our ecosystem. And then people were trading um, the in-game items there with the um, um, challenges of, you know, sometimes people get hacked because there is no guarantee that you know, like someone who is selling an item there actually has the item or like acting in, in good, good Good belief. So the way we wanted to solve the problem was actually um, introducing a 
the real money trading system inside inside the game that was actually the uh, starting point of idea of having a diablo 3 auction house which is which does work in in, in with real money um we looked into that uh, project for almost th three years and then we, and, and it faced a lot of different problems such as we realized that um for for Blizzard Entertainment to run a real money auction house, we definitely need to satisfy the financial regulation of almost two hundred different countries around the world where BattleNet has a presence. So at the end of the day, it its launch was not global, uh, only confined to U.S. And then also the um um the it was turned out not to be a great success either. And the reason I was actually excited to get really excited about the Web3 and um, AI is that those changes I faced along the way, now I see that it could be solved by applying those um, either Gen AI or Web3 or combine those clouds together to solve these problems. Um, one, one good example would be the um, living and breathing world. Now we have a technology where Gen AI can actually apply to have a um, uh, NPCs to, to really have a personality and also have a, have a life in game. Uh, that is something that like really excites me about the future of generative AI instead of um, actually helping to create a more and better content inside the game. And obviously, Gen AI could also be a, a solution to the um, like content problem as well. I'm not saying that the um, um, content should be created fully, solely by Gen AI. Uh, the, the way I see the Gen AI is that um, you can actually, you should still need to create all the baseline, you know, creative content yourself. And then Gen, Gen AI could be applied to the, um, to the multi, like force multiply the amount of content you have in, in game so that it definitely provide more variety than like you can produce um, with your own hand. And then the, the problems I faced, economic problems I, we faced in, in, in terms of gold farmers, power leveling, whatnot. If you think about it, if you know anything about Web3, you heard about it as a part of the um, like, uh, Web3 uh, industry. So again, to summarize what I've been talking about so far is that like game rotation has always evolved over time. During my 30 years tenure in, in, in game industry, any game I worked on, I have to think about what kind of Monetary system or means for all we need to have, and those evolved, changed all the time. It has never stopped in one place. And then revolutionary new ideas came about roughly once in 10 years. So if you remember my last slide, there is a 30 years ago, the beans model we were using was pay per minute, and then it went to the subscription to the current free to play. And then actually, if you think about the, um, think about it, the free to play regime has been around almost 10 years. And I think that the, um, like in 2020s, we are still trying to figure out what is that new revolutionary game monetization model. And then I think that the answer is is is, is in in Web three. So thinking about different ways of free to play monetization, I think that the free to play monetization can be categorized into three different ways. One is um, selling vanity. In other way, it is called a cosmetics. Another thing is sometimes we sell time, meaning that the um, like you you pay to 
um, exchange it to, to less time, um, or you can call it a progression system as well. Sometimes we, we sell a power, like you can pay to exchange the power you can have in game. So it is a little bit like similar to um, trading time. The difference here is that the, um, instead of reducing the time requirement, the power sales is giving you the power in exchange for money directly. So you can call it pay to win. Um, but over the last 10 years, this free to play game model also evolved and faced, you know, quite a few different challenges to solve. Again, the um, like gold farmers, power leveling, secondary market, uh, one, of, one of those problems because it actually create a really big market. Um, in case of World of Warcraft, one, at one moment, when I calculated, you know, how much of the secondary market exists in World of Warcraft, it was as much as um, World of Warcraft was making at the time, back in 2009. And then that was essentially close to a billion dollars per year. So we were leaving that amount of money on the table by just leaving all farmers do that, the, um, like helping the service. And the other problem was that yeah, uh, there are a lot of unbanked audience in secondary plus emerging market, mainly because um, like emerging market, most of the uh, people have either don't have an access to a bank system or the uh, credit card. And then uh, most of the Western payment system is based on the um, like credit card. And then also assume that the, um, like the game players uh, would they have any access to um, like banking system, which is not the case in a lot of a lot of the emerging market. And and finally, um, one interesting observation that arise out of this uh, free to play um, syndrome is that like, roughly um, ninety seven percent of game players are either not paying much of money. Or like they they want to minimize whatever they are paying to the um, like game developers, and which leads to the uh, like three percent of whales, so called whales, that are paying quite a lot of money to um, to to for the um, game developers to have a um, like have a uh, profitability, they need to have that the um, like three percent whale. And, and how to deal with those two different type of audience was actually a pretty important thing in free-to-play models. So with that in mind, all those problems seem to be something solved by crypto, if you think about it. You can have a um, um, like play to own and NFT marketplaces so that you can actually allow people to um, exchange, like do those trading uh, without risk. And also you can actually like charging a transaction fee to get revenue um, from, from that channel. Also, crypto is also supposed to um, solve the, um, um, the payment issue as well, because it's in, in theory, it is supposed to be transnational. Um, you don't have to worry about the systems in, in each country to exchange um, cryptocurrency. And then also the, um, the, the, the fact that the, um, like you can give the ownership to the players, hopefully be able to address in you know, a whale and uh, free-to-play divide that exists any kind of game, um, free-to-play free game. So that was initially why I was so excited about the Web3 as a um, um, like new system that can be applied to or revolutionize um, Web3 games. But as I started to study and get to know more about Web3, 
the whole ecosystem seems a little bit, you know, confusing and counterintuitive because people talk about the white paper, um, ICOs and economics, um, DAOs and ecosystem, everything needs to be um, like decentralized. And I couldn't understand, like as, as a game developer, like what all those has anything, anything to do with building a great game. Because people talked about the writing a white paper so that the yeah, people so that the um, like investors and players will know that what kind of game um, they'll be playing. The problem here is that the um, in whatever game design and economy you have, you plan to do at first, it will be quite different once we develop it because it is close to impossible to have a um, like like clear game design and gameplay, especially it is a um, like action type of games, you cannot have a um, um, white paper plan expect that it, it will stay the same um, in, in the future. And the other thing is also, you know, the comic system design, people were talking about the, doing the economy design upfront in, in crypto. But that also like didn't make any, any sense to someone who has worked on the um, like MMO game for a long time, because having a those system means that the um, like you assume that the external variables to to mess with your in game balance from the beginning. Then you also you don't know how to. Uh, imp it is also pretty close impossible to figuring out a equilibrium before you actually try out and try to iteratively um, try to balance, balance that system. Uh, so what most of the crypto game companies talking about in, in economy, to me, it didn't make any sense. And finally, like the DAO, the idea of having a um, like invested people to create a committee to figure out what is the best for the you know, like game's future, but in conventional game development, committee-driven game design is one of the worst, thi worst thing you, you can do and easiest way to kill your game because it never leads into a good, great game. On, on top of that, the, um, like most of the Web3 game companies, the white paper, the more I look at it, the more I start to think that the, um, like, this is actually not a game building but creating a um, like marketplace, then if everyone is really building marketplace, then who's actually building your game? I call it breeding cow. So, so that was what was I felt really weird about the yeah, like the whole Web three um, game industry discussions and and the development of the last few years. And then on top of that, for anyone creating a really good game is super hard. And then as far as I know, there is no proven model that has a um, like good balance in terms of Web3 economy. So what that means is that the um, creating a Web3 game is even a lot harder than building typical Web2 games. So building any kind of Web3 game essentially means that it is an extremely difficult thing to do. But like I said, you know, if you forget about all the crazy crypto talk, if you forget about economics, if you forget about DAO planning, if you forget about doing Discord community management, what not from the get go, even before you have any, any kind, of, kind of game. And look at it purely as a solution to your monetization problem. Meaning that yeah, like it, it can actually allow you to create your game account or game asset tradable. Also, you make sure that your in-game economy works 
make sure that it works first before you introduce any kind of Web3 system. And then also the, like forget about building Web3 because like it, is, it is super hard to have a um, um, like Web3 system and most of them actually do, you, you don't need anyways. So build everything with Web2 first, prove that it works as a game. And then focus on removing what, whatever friction you have in your game because players don't need to know about Web3 to play a game. And then you can have that those Web3 features to work in the background nowadays. And then provide a, you know, maybe um, out of game manual opt-in process for Web3 enthusiasts. As they already know what Web3 is, you don't need to train them. Um, but at the same time, you should not ask you know, someone who doesn't know about Web3 to try to help them to become Web3 enthusiasts. It's either they want to become one or not. And I think that you know, like trying to, you know, using a game as a um, opt-in process, I think it is, is not a great idea. Um, if you build a system and then the, like, if you enjoy your game, then they'll do it. Um, if you think, if they think that it can, it, by, by doing it, if they can make some sort of money. So that is how, how I believe that the, um, like you, you need to design um, your Web3 features, mostly around monetization. And then you, you also need to have like three different principles. One is that you, know, like you should build fast, test, reiterate, so that you can actually test out economy really works. And once you have a proof of concept with that, you should you know, vertically, horizontally scale after that. And then think about the like scaling into the real external Web3 system as a last step. And on top of that, if you think about the um, like Gen AI as a as a one way to integrate in, into your system, is that the um, easiest way as of today should be um, like around UGC because Gen AI putting that into a part of your debt pipeline is, is actually pretty hard to do, it's, especially if you are trying to build a something like to put uh, double A plus type of, of game, then main, so one of the key issues that you will be having is that the, um, you, you need to solve IP problems. So, and then the, um, like, if you have a Gen AI created um, asset in your game, uh, you, you may have a legal risk um, coming up, but you know, if you use Gen AI tool as a tool to assist players to come up with the, um, the new UGC and also let players to own what they create. Meaning that the, um, like you should already, I already talked about the, um, you should create your own, own, own content, even in Gen AI um, creation. But with Web3, you can actually allow those players to actually own that, own the stuff they actually created. So with that, you can come up with, you, you, you have a monetization system that is combined with Web3 and AI. With all that said, I think that you should make sure that you can read the kettles first, meaning that you should provide a tangible value to your player own asset, right? Just, um, just the ideal, idea of having an asset in your game doesn't solve anything at all because there needs to be a reason why players want to have that asset and then you need to provide that why to those players and something can be that is something that can be done like intentional design um, in the economy but unfortunately i'm like a lot of the um um games that design around NFTs are not thinking that as a part of the, the game design. Also, that value needs to build within your game, not externally. 
because without internal value, what whatever external value you create is just a bubble and it will, it will pop at some point. So if you focus on building value internally and then allow players to own a part of it as, a, um, as an asset, that external value will, will come later. The only downside of, of, of this, this idea is that you, know, you are not able to use um, like NFTs or token, your token system as a fundraising mechanism because I'm kind of like precluding that you should build all of this your, your own and then, you know, start to sell NFTs or, you know, introduce a token economics uh, or what, what not. Um, but I think that the, um, like the history of how monetary system um, evolved over time, as well as how people people's emotions works in, in game economy, I do believe that that is the right way. Unless you start with the, um, like you don't announce your game at all, um, like build everything, testing, and then announcement is sales of NFT as well. So this is something that, that most of the um, like Web3 um, game developers that don't do, or the opposite of what, what they do. But I do think that this is definitely the right way of building um, Web3 games. Again, you know, I talked about there are three things that free to play games really sell. The vanity, all the cosmetics. This could be enhanced by introducing unique UGC that your game can create. And then that is a one of the best um, use case of AI as of today. Again, this needs to be um, having AI to provide a, a different version of your own IP, not someone else's IP, introducing it to your, your game. So that's something that you gotta be really careful. Um, and then uh, both time and power, now you can actually capture that value as a, either as a um, token or as a um, um, NFT. Then that's how you should look at um, how to monetize um, like using a uh, monetization using Web3 as a technology. So to summarize, so one of the first steps that to introduce Web3 economy into a game is that the um, like figure out figuring figure out a way to provide value to accumulate value in player's account or in game item. And then allow them to be able to sell or trade. You know, it's not about selling players the item, but the um, like allow people to create their account and, and make, make them tradable. And I would charge fee for the privilege of, of the sales. So essentially that is a similar to the um, like charging a fee on their trade, but that would be the first way you can make it a um, like interesting economy around it. And also allow and allow to create and own their own user generated content. Um, that's another way to, to create a lot of value there. Um, and once they are all done, I mean, above two could be built in Web2. So build in Web2 first to test out those theories. And then once your economy works uh, fairly well as a closed system, that is when you should try to think about the um, like go external, um, but do external in a way that the, um, like it doesn't destroy um, your internal economy. Because once your economy is destroyed, Getting back to the um, like original state is at the close to impossible. So that's why uh, I believe that the uh, like sequence needs to be doing it internal and then go external later. All right. So 
then why am I focusing on monetization only? Um, one key reason is that yeah, like the more I think about graphic bridge technology, it has nothing to do with, with the gameplay itself. Um, and also, uh, if you think about a free to play as a game, free to play also is a business model. It doesn't really impact any kind of gameplay um, implication, but as free to play as a monetization system matures, there came about a lot of different mechanics that allows the monetization, but also increase retention and engagement of game player. And that it is called the progression system. So the way I look at Web3 is also the, I'm like, initially, whatever Web3 does, all and in itself, it has nothing to do with game mechanics. But as Web3 as a monetary stack improves over time, it will start to have an um, impact, come up with a system that actually um, impact the, um, like some of the gameplay flow. So it, it will impact the meta game, but not the moment to moment gameplay. So, and then the, um, um, so the example I'm showing here is that the, the Vampire Survival was a PC game. So the, it, that was released in, on Steam in uh, December, 2021. I think that the, most of you guys heard about it. So it is, it's, it, it is a lifetime revenue. Um, this is like one year ago. Its lifetime revenue was around 10 million US dollars. They, they were sold millions of copies. And then um, one mobile game developer like took that game, literally copied everything, and then put a progression and monetization system on top of it. And then released it as a free to play game on mobile. And they had a um, $50 million revenue on its release month. So more revenue than Steam games lifetime revenue in a, in a month. So this is you know what monetization system of the different monetization, the business model can have an impact on the um, like size of your game. Again, this is why I I think that the um, like monetization is one of the most important thing to think about when you when you when you try to create a Web three game. Um, and then finally. One thing you have to think a lot about when you build a your game and try to adopt a Web3 monetization system is that there are three different kinds of audience you are facing. And then they are casual, competitive, and buyers or, or investors. So the first two type of players, uh, typical ones that you face um, in any kind of free-to-play games, but the um, like investor class is something that only Web3 game has. And then up until to up until now, I think that the, like the, when you think about the um, like Web3 games um, or someone who are building Web3 games, they essentially focus on those investor class. And then one thing they really forget about or the um, like didn't think about is that the um, if your game is like solely um, composed with the um, um, investor class only, no one will want to spend money because everyone is there to to make money, right? So your economy will will not be able to balance and it will go bankrupt. So that's why no matter what you do, you have to think about you you have to balance the um and provide different experience to casual, competitive, and also like investor class in, in your audience. So it, again, add additional difficulty to your game design and economy balance, uh, but something you have to solve. Okay, um, so that is um, all I, I have um, for, this, for this talk.
Um, so, is there any um, any way to I can get questions if anyone has a has a questions? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks a lot for for a, for an interesting talk. Uh, it was really really insightful to listen about the FTP games. Um, okay, so uh, what's your? Uh, can you tell us about your like main forecasts? What's waiting for FT, FTP games in the future? Uh, what's your most? Uh, what? Which forecasts are you most positive about? Uh, could you could you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah, uh, which forecasts about the future of uh, free-to-play game monetization uh, you are like most certain in? Which are which which ones of them seem uh, more uh, realistic than others? Oh, I I do think that you know all the different aspects I talked about is viable, um, and also the um like the things that that are sort of the um, um like low hanging fruit. Per se. So I, I I didn't talk about the um like stuff that could could only possible like with all these low hanging fruit are done. So I think that the um that are, there will be a lot of different ways to to enhance free to play using using uh, Web three as a monetary system. So it will revolutionize how we think about monetization, how we think about the ownership, whatnot. Not. But you know, not in a way that the um, not in a way that it will have a like fundamental impact on gameplay itself. So to me, uh, free to play and Web three is a purely business model, uh, less of the um, like gameplay mechanic, the gameplay impacting uh, technology. Got it. Thank you. And what about the future of uh, hyper casual games? Uh, do you believe that they're gonna last uh, for a while uh, in the game dev industry? Uh, I think it dep depends. So the the problem hyper casual is facing is the the arbitrage they were doing in the past doesn't really work any further. Meaning by arbitrage, so they were essentially relying on the um um like user acquisition cost is lower than um you know the the amount of ad they can serve to their audience, right? And then, thanks to the I'm like, thanks to the all the changes that's happening in in um, mobile ecosystem, that cost has become higher now. So that's why they are like not profitable. So the the issue here is that I don't think that the um like the the, the cost itself. I mean, the amount of revenue they can create will change. And then, and then the question becomes that it, if there is any way they can actually reduce the um, um, their cost of acquisition lower, getting back to their state. So, unless they figure out, figure it out, so hyper casual the future will be quite grim. But I know that you know, like there are some people like quite quite a lot of young people are interested in solving that specific problem. How to figure out a way to have a um, um like the audience is cheaper than than it is now getting away from the, um, the all these uh, issues we're having um in, in mobile game industry so i would say that you know, like yeah like this is 50 50 but because you have to come up with a solution to solve it but the, whoever come up with that solution um I, I guess they will be a be able to become really big yeah. Okay. Sounds reasonable. Thank you. Uh, there is also one uh, another question. Um, when do you think uh, the major AAA players in the gaming market will start using Web three? Uh, because the current Web three games are clearly not up to quality projects. Yeah. So there is a, a chicken and egg problem um, for any any AAA studio, especially after Crypto Winter. So for triple A studio to to come back to Web three, there will need to be someone who are really successful, um, who were like let's say double A or you know indie level Web three games, 
unless there is a proof of, of that success case, I, I don't think it will, like to play game companies will, will come back in the field. Um, especially right now, the um, like the the brand like Web three as a brand has become like the it has become so bad, right? Most of the um, um like public companies don't don't even want, want to touch it unless you are someone from you know like Asia, like from Korea or Japan. Um, they're, they're still some of the bigger companies. They still do Web three games, but not not in the West as far as I know. Okay, got it. Thank you so much for the answer. Um, actually, I don't see any more questions left. But anyways, um, guys, feel free to reach out to Taiwan and ask him questions uh, whenever you have any. And thanks a lot again for 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 an awesome talk. And we hope you enjoy games gathering so far. So. We hope to see you soon back here again. I, I hope so as well. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.